I'm Remy Warren, and I've lived my life in the wild. As a professional guide and hunter, I've spent thousands of days perfecting my craft. I want to give that knowledge to you. In this podcast, we relive some of my past adventures as I give you practical hunting tips to make you more successful. Whether you're just getting started or a lifelong hunter, this podcast will bring you along on the hunt and teach you how to live wild. This podcast is brought to you by Mountain Tough and Yeti. A lot of the tactics I talk about here require you to be in top physical shape. So I partnered with Mountain Tough to help get you ready for the mountain. With their science-based, hunter-specific training app, you'll get in shape and mentally tough, able to tackle any hunt. Because we really believe this will help you be more successful, as a listener to this podcast, we're giving you six free weeks to get you started. Just use code LIVEWILD. Yeti's been a longtime supporter of mine and has some of the best products out there, including their just released 15 and 60 Go boxes. These are durable, stackable, dust and watertight storage that's great for organizing and transporting all your favorite gear to and from the field. I actually got to test some of these this past season and put them through the paces traveling from hunt to hunt. It kept my stuff accessible and protected. Practical in so many situations, from raft trips down the river to elk camp in the Rockies, it's nearly indestructible, go anywhere storage that's now available. everyone welcome back to the live wild podcast with a really tough winter in just so many places across the country certain populations really got hit hard this week we're going to talk about the effects of a brutal winter across the west we're going to look at some data and what that means for hunters planning their hunts for this fall we're going to dive into what to expect to look for for this season and what to expect in the future as well We're also going to cover some of the benefits that this winter might have in certain areas and how hunting tactics might change with added moisture. But first, I want to share the story of a harsh winter that affected my hunt years later. So this hunt took place back in 2014, and I drew a deer tag that I'd always wanted to hunt. I was really excited because it was a a premium deer tag in a county where I think at the time the majority of Boone and Crockett deer throughout the history of since they've been keeping records came from this particular county it was northern new mexico it was a really good late season hunt Uh, it, it actually this particular area would get migrations from different places so deer would migrate in from uh potentially utah primarily colorado and then other places in new mexico as well it was a winter range i had a a great unit in here and was hoping for the buck of a lifetime you know you just hear stories growing up about the the potential of deer in this county looking through flipping through pope and young or boone and crockett record books Uh, the county keeps coming up high scoring bucks like it was just a producer of very good deer had great genetics and good age class Combining those two things makes for a high-quality hunt. I put in for the tag for a very long time with no points in New Mexico or no preference points, just everybody on a random draw. I was ex- felt extremely fortunate to draw, and I think it was actually my first premium mule deer tag I'd ever drawn in an, for an out-of-state hunt. So I was very excited and kind of had, you know, the same thing you would think of drawing any you know, famed mule deer tag. I think there's a few places in the country that kind of get that fame and maybe the, the Arizona Strip's one of them. Uh, you know, maybe if you're fortunate enough to draw Utah Henry's or Ponce tag, something like that. There's a couple of units in Colorado that have that just allure to it where you go, okay, I, I get to hunt these famed big mule deer areas. And as a guy that is very passionate about mule deer hunting and chasing big mature bucks, this was just a dream come true. So I I planned out, I think I planned out around seven days to hunt. A buddy of mine was coming down to film, actually uh, filming it for Western Hunter Magazine. And so Nate Simmons came down to go on the hunt with me, check out the area, because he'd always wanted to go on the hunt as well. And it's just one of those areas, man, if I think if somebody had offered me the opportunity to go on the hunt or film it with them, I would have jumped at it because I was really excited about getting in and checking this country out. So... We get down there and, you know, there's a few things that you kind of expect. You expect crunchy snow and hard to get close to deer. And you expect to have to hunt fairly hard. I think I've probably even told the story of this hunt in in different ways or pieces of it. But we saw a lot of deer. Uh, Seeing deer wasn't the problem. But I knew the potential that that unit could hold. And 
I was holding out. But I didn't. We didn't see the type of deer we were looking for. It just felt like to me a certain age class of buck was missing. So we would see, you know, young bucks and bachelor groups of young bucks. Some deer's kind of still rutting. It was late. It's kind of a winter range. You would get a little bit of a second rut or a second estrus in there, and they would exhibit rutting behavior. Then you'd see bucks off by themselves. And with good genetics and other things, you you would kind of hope that you look over enough deer, sooner or later that that big buck pops, like the one that you go, wow, that's that's the deer that this unit is known for, this region is known for. And we hunted for a week and just didn't couldn't turn up that kind of, of deer. The weather was cold. It was, I don't even remember, some nights were 20 below. It was a it was a cold, frigid hunt. And uh, but which was, you know, good for the area. There's snow in the mountains, which would push deer in from other units, units in Utah, potentially primarily units in Colorado, other areas would push deer off a reservation. You wanted the snow. So we got, everything seemed to line up, right? Just the deer weren't there. Well, I mean, the deer were there, saw plenty of deer, big mature bucks weren't there. And so in day seven, continued to hunt and i can't even remember i was like nate what you got going i think i'm gonna stay and he's like cool let's stay so we just kept staying and kept hunting and i think i hunted pretty much the entire season uh, until the last day i found a deer that i was interested in shooting i passed up multiple bucks i had opportunities i mean there was a couple times where i could have just shot like a 160 class four point, which in most places, if I was hunting mule deer, I hunted a week, that's a great buck. But just in the back of my mind knew that there could be this just absolute giant anywhere. And the last day I ended up seeing a, a better buck, uh, uh, not nothing crazy, maybe mid 170s, maybe bigger. And it was the best deer we'd seen in the entire season of hunting. And I did stalk some other deer, just there was some big three points and some things I thought like, well, if I can't find the buck I'm looking for, then this would be a cool buck. I, I do like me some big three by threes. If you know me, you know, I like the big threes. Uh, if I find one, I'll try to stalk it. Hard to pass up. But for the most part, it just seemed like even that the better buck that we saw, it didn't seem like it was in that correct age class that you're looking for to get that combination of the genetics and the age and, and hopefully good feed. And that year had, it was a normal water year. Everything seemed good. The thing that was missing was what appeared to be six year old deer, six, seven year old bucks. And the one thing that I didn't consider and probably wouldn't have considered and, and really didn't realize it until afterwards, kind of analyzing and thinking about the hunt was what happened essentially six years earlier in 2008 it was there was a bad winter a winter very similar and actually not even as severe as the winter we're currently having so when i was pulling up the snowpack and trends and looking at these things i noticed oh this was that hunt i went on it was weird because i just i felt like i did i was didn't see the right kind of deer and then I check out the the snowpack and go, okay, well, five, six years earlier, there was a bad winter followed by kind of another, a semi-harsh winter the year before. There was just kind of a string of bad winters. And then we go into that season and I, and I look into the record books, pulling up some Boone and Crockett stats and other things. The year prior to that bad winter, 2007, there had been 11 typical bucks taken that were made that Boone and Crockett minimum. 2008, the year of that bad winter, four, then also two non-typicals. But then we jumped down the line to the year that I had the tag, and there was only a single Boone and Crockett deer taken that year. All the other years kind of tended to seem like there was, you know, a few or average, and then that year in particular, of course, there's a lot of other factors that just plummeted down and for the next couple of years it was pretty low and when I started to think about this and, and look at that I go oh man the effects of that winter were probably played out in low fawn survival a missing age class and it affected a hunt years down the road when I wasn't even thinking about it 
So what we're going to look at today is talk about how this winter is going to affect this season, but also thinking about, well, what are the plays further down the line? And then what are some things that we can look at that might shift that bad winter into favorable conditions by looking at areas that weren't hit so hard? So what we're going to look at this week is how the winter might affect some of your hunt and hunt planning across the West. We're also going to look at some things that you can do to do a little bit of research and understand, okay, how did the area that I'm going to be hunting fare? And then what are some workarounds to find more success? We're also going to think about how's this going to affect the unit in the future and what are the immediate and long-term effects? And then how does that play into my entire hunting strategy? So we'll dive into that and then we'll even touch a little bit on maybe how to hunt or change your tactics based on the added moisture in certain areas. So let's dive in. And and the first thing that we're going to address is of course, it was a pretty harsh winter a lot of places. Now, there is a lot of data on tracking snow, tracking precipitation, all these things. Uh, right now, I'm just kind of looking at the USDA site. They've got it essentially shows like the snow water equivalent percentage. And then it compares it to the average between, say, 1999 and 2020. And then it shows you the percentage of precipitation and snowpack based off of those. And when you start clicking around based on different watersheds, you know, a lot of the places out west are well over 100%. So there's some places that are 100%, so that would be your average snowpack. There's places like the Sierras is almost 300%, maybe even more in some of those areas. And then you go, we're talking like places that got hit really hard, places in Colorado, uh, say Western Colorado, Eastern Utah. I saw, I found a place that had 1500% of the average snowpack. And when we talk about that, we, we see massive winter kills, extremely low fawn survival rates and really bad health going in to the coming year. Now, some of those areas are areas that deer migrate out of naturally. So then we look at the winter range and that winter range might be 100 or 200 percent of the annual snowpack where those animals are going into. So this affects a lot of things. It affects the survival rate of the animals. It affects the immediate population and it also affects, you know, future populations. I think one of the biggest factors of winter kill is that survival rate of those fawns that are going to be born. So when your fawn crop drops, well, your future uh, populations decrease as well. There's some areas included in Northern Utah districts that they've found may have lose 70% of its adult deer and 90% of its fawns. Those are extremely bad outcomes from what they're seeing. And so what we're seeing in some, the snow tell reports is obviously big snowfalls, long winter, and in some places, a lot of winter kill. Fishing game has to feed some animals in areas. It looks like doom and gloom, right? Now, that isn't to say that there aren't areas getting hit really hard, but there are also areas that didn't get so hard and benefited from additional moisture. A lot of the country has been in a drought. And when we see these things, we kind of forget about the cycles that we go in. We've all seen bad winters before in certain areas, and those areas die off and then other areas pick up and as those other areas gain traction then secretly these other spots that had bad winters are are slowly regaining and gaining and, and coming back to hopefully what they once were so there are benefits and there are downfalls to having these kind of winters now we never really want a bunch of winter kill and, and being really hard on wildlife because one it's not good for the wildlife two it definitely decreases hunter opportunity hunter success uh, it increases hunter congestion in some areas so these are all things that we have to think about when it comes to the planning phase of our hunt we're still in that i, I call it application season where it's not too late to adjust now there are i've got a tag in an area that I, I picked up an over-the-counter tag in a certain spot in Idaho, and it's like, cool, that's the place that got hit really hard. You know, I don't know whether I'm going to try to exchange the tag, maybe not go on the hunt, maybe turn it back in, give those animals a little bit of a break. But that isn't also to mean that you still can't have a good hunt 
even if some of the areas that you're hunting got hit. So we're going to, we're going to look at some of this stuff, talk a little bit about what each state's doing and, and some of the things to look for and then where to go from there. So I think the first thing is just this time of year, what happens is you can often apply for tags, but sometimes the you'll have applied and then the draw will happen after the state does some kind of count and finalizes the numbers of tags that they're going to recommend. So the biologists will recommend tags. So they have a suggested amount of tags that you apply for. Then they recommend tags and issue. They're going to say like, hey, we recommended 100 tags. Bad winter, did our counts, bad whatever. We're going to now issue 20. And then the draw happens. And so there's just fewer tags issued. That's going to mean that there's fewer opportunities and fewer tags drawn. But there's also some places where you can change those options. Uh, Utah's one, Nevada's another one. So you can go in there, you can make changes before that draw happens based off of what's happening with the winter. And I, and I actually suggest that you look at it in a couple ways. So areas that had bad winter kills but might still have a population that's huntable, probably fewer people are going to play. So it might increase your odds of drawing the fewer tags. Now, you might say like, oh, that's terrible to say to go hunt an area that had, was already hit hard. The biologists are managing that area. Some areas actually were overpopulation. They had a winter kill and there's still more deer there than in other places, more antelope, more elk, whatever. As long as the fishing game recommends tags, I feel like filling those amount of tags is acceptable. But I think what you want to do in the planning phase is pay attention to what's going on. So, you know, northwestern Colorado, there's... 150 percent approximately higher than average snowfall and it's got a very large elk herd but the severe winter there has resulted in very high calf mortality so above average you know, cows dying uh, above average probably malnutrition so stillborn or unborn calves low recruitment they're recommending really big reductions in a number of licenses there in, in certain areas, and maybe as many as 40% in hunter licenses in some areas. This is just some stuff that I was just reading from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife put out. Uh, Utah, same kind of deal. Big projected losses in certain units. And so they're going to reduce, you know, they've issued things for don't shed hunt. They've done some other things. They're dropping a lot of general season deer permits, which is really good and really needed and might actually help some of these units in the future as far as trophy quality goes by just, you know, letting a few more deer survive. But they've had such a mass death that uh, you know, it's going to take a while for some units to come back from it. Now, a lot of this is doom and gloom, right? But we're, we're going to talk about that. Then we're going to kind of look at the silver lining here in a minute. So Wyoming... There's a lot of winter kill. Some places, I mean, I've, I, and some of this might be anecdotal, but I, they've estimated in a couple areas almost 80% pronghorn not surviving. That's pretty crazy. And they do have some of the highest pronghorn populations. I think that some of the units that I've seen in Wyoming, when if 20% survive, that's still probably more pronghorn than half the units in Nevada. But it is a huge hit for what you're used to and the area and how many animals that area is traditionally holding. And it's a huge hit for hunters. Idaho, same deal. Oregon, I mean, whatever state, you name it, a lot of states got hit hard this year. But we know that. So knowing that, we can go into the season in the planning phase and look at a few things. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about a few of the things to look at. First would be going to the state website looking at the meeting minutes and and figuring out how many tags are they actually issuing what are the changes being made sometimes these are i mean they're all made public sometimes it's not super easy to find but you can go in you can look at commission meetings you can say tag recommendations accepted tag recommendations for places that maybe you haven't applied yet or where the draw hasn't happened and you can change your your options or for hunts that are coming up maybe you've got a tag in a certain area where you go okay i should look at this and say what kind of mortality happened in my unit what is the ramifications if I hunt it like, or don't hunt it? Can I turn my tag back in, gain my points? Should I hunt later? Is later even going to be a better option? So those are going to be what we're going to talk about. 
A couple of the ways that I start to do this research, I obviously I, I look and see what the tag recommendations are. I also look at some of the snowpack for a lot of different areas. So I'll pull up that USDA or Snowtel info. There's an active map, and it just it goes with like coloration. What's it? NRCS.USDA.gov, and then there's some maps on there. And once I go through these maps, it really shows, you know, essentially a large area of, you know, swathed into percentages based off of annual snowfall. So a lot of the West, over 100%. But then you'll find areas within this that maybe this area was particularly hit and the next one nearby wasn't hit as hard. You're going to find these areas that you go, okay, everywhere had above average snowfall, which uh, – you know, take it a few steps back isn't always bad. And we're going to, we're going to, you know, hear more about that in a minute, but you're looking at areas where it's like, okay, here's extremely high snowfall. Here's extremely high uh, snowpack, whatever. How's that going to affect the area? Well, harsh winters kill animals, but there's a lot of areas that maybe didn't get hit as hard. So we're going to start focusing on those areas. And that could be just saying, Hey, we're changing our application from this to this. These are pockets within certain states or certain units, even where this range didn't get hit as hard because of the topography and another mountain range soaked it up. I, I did a lot of driving this March and April throughout places across the West because I just wanted to get my eyes and see like what's happening. We took a couple of big road trips, drove through units that I hunt, drove in units that I'm thinking about hunting, looking at areas that are winter range. And what I saw kind of surprised me because there was areas where we would be in one particular spot and you go like the sagebrush, the fences are covered up. The sagebrush, the, the snow in April 1st was Actually, this was what the last one I did it was April and through the 7th or something, just driving around checking units. And I mean, I couldn't believe how much snow there was. And then I would go 20 miles further into maybe a different range and completely normal. Maybe not normal, good snow, but south facing slopes burnt off, uh, animals about. It's like there's places that are right next to places that got hit hard that. Now the, the neighboring unit isn't so bad. And it's very interesting to me because you kind of think of it all as, oh, it all got hammered. When in reality, every range in every area is completely unique and different. Sometimes there's a mountain range that will soak up that weather and it just skips an area and, and hits it further on. I don't really know. I'm not a meteorologist. And if I were, I'd probably be bad at predicting things. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I can say just from boots on the ground is it sounds bad and it is bad. There are definitely areas that got hit. There are states that got hit. There's a large portion of areas that got hit. But there are other areas that are going to benefit from this added moisture. Because when we look at the past few years, I would say even five, six years, a lot of areas in the West have been in a drought and this much needed water is going to bring a few benefits. So some of those benefits are, especially in arid country, you're going to get good grass growth. That good grass growth is going to have the exact opposite effect. It's going to have a good fawn survival. It's going to have good nutrition and it's going to have really good antler growth. So when we're talking about certain areas like uh, maybe there's places in Utah, places in definitely in Arizona, you look at the price of you know, a deer tag that auctions for, well, I can't even remember the exact number, but $700,000 or more. I maybe I, I probably shouldn't quote it because I remembered it and then forgot exactly how much it was, but insane, record-breaking tag prices going for record-breaking numbers in some areas because there's going to be good antler growth. There's more water than there's ever been and aquifers are filling up. It's going to lead to good herd health and great hunting. So there are areas that have been hit hard and there has been areas that are benefiting. So when we're looking at our application process, the key is going to be finding those places that maybe you're benefiting. Maybe when we look at, I'm looking at an area right now on here that had 300% water right next to an area, another watershed, just essentially split by the orientation of a range. So all the watershed, meaning like the water is going into this from these mountains and a, a watershed right next door that's 100%. So you go, that one's doing good. This one's doing 
too good, I guess. Like, so we're looking at it like that and you go, okay, well, there's a lot of areas that are actually benefiting. And so, well, I'm looking at, I see a place here in Arizona. I don't know. It's saying it's 18,000% water. And I don't, and that's not probably a lot of snowpack, but you're talking about an insane amount of water that's going to benefit aquifers, creeks, springs, uh, just grass growth for years to come. So there are downsides and there are benefits. And we're going to look for those areas that weren't hit so hard if we have the opportunity to adjust our plans and adjust where we're going. Now, the, the flip side to that is I have hunted areas right after potentially what they consider large die-offs and have had good success and still saw good numbers where I go, it was an area that had a very high population. They still allowed hunting in some tags. I had an antelope tag in an area like this quite a few years ago, uh, an archery antelope tag. I ran into no other hunters. It was an area that should have taken me a couple of years to draw. And I just kind of picked it up my first year of applying. I thought, I'll give it a shot. It might suck. Everybody thought it was going to suck. And I still found good animals in there and was successful with my bow and had a great hunt. So there's that, that kind of aspect to it as well. Those areas that maybe got hit, but didn't get hit so hard. And the thing that I look for in those areas is where are the animals wintering? So I was just looking at a couple areas here that got hammered with snow and knowing the deer or sorry, knowing the elk and deer migration patterns from this particular unit, I checked the winter range and that particular winter range was slightly above average, which isn't bad. You, you just think about average and go, okay, a little bit more or a little bit less. It fluctuates year to year, but it isn't that devastating when the winter range didn't get hit so hard. And I go, okay, well, the snow is still holding on in some of those high alpine basins, those summer basins. But what's going to happen when those animals move back is there's going to be good feed. There's going to be, you know, a lot of water in a lot of places that maybe didn't have water. The springs will be pumping. The aquifers are full. They're going to have a very good habitat to go back to for the summer range where they're going to be bulking up and doing the majority of their growing. Now, there might still be a lot of snow in that summer range, and that's going to be the factor that decides – okay, how's that hunt going to pan out? What's the antler growth going to look like? Or, or are they going to be just displaced in that unit in a little bit different areas? That's one thing that when we go into our hunt planning from, okay, I've got a tag, I'm going to hunt it. The winter was a little hard. What are some things that I can look at throughout the summer to kind of decide where to focus my attention in the fall season? And that's going to be, how long is that snow holding on? What's that snowpack level look like in July? In August, uh, are there those basins still chock full of snow where it would normally be good feed, good, good habitat, um, or are they going to be displaced in kind of a little bit different country? So when it comes time for the season, they're just places that you weren't expecting them through the rest of the year. And I've encountered this a lot of places, a lot of different years. There was a place that I was hunting, was it? I can't even remember the year, quite a few years back, but place that I hunted every year, early season archery. I went in there one year and there's still freaking snow from the winter prior. And I didn't see the animals where I thought I should see them. So I adjusted, I, I dropped down in elevation. I actually pulled out from that area and just really reassessed and said, okay, where, where are these animals going to be? Uh, they, they probably weren't there. They went to a different place in the unit. I found some other South facing slopes in lower elevation than I was used to hunting. And sure enough, start turning up elk. And so you just have to adjust your tactics depending on what the winter looked like, the area you were, maybe think about applying or finding a different hunt in a different place and focusing on those areas that are really, really benefiting right now. So we can focus on there. There's a lot of bad that came with a harsh winter. We can acknowledge that, but we can also move on and say, there's a lot of good as well. Where are areas that are benefiting right now? These are going to be the areas that I'm going to focus on. Where are areas within kind of the region that maybe got hit that had not so bad winter range that has still is going to have not so bad of winter kill that still has those tags and maybe other people are going to shy away from. And this is really going to play a factor too in some of those general units where you, you have the opportunity to hunt kind of anywhere in the state and you go okay well this area got hit i'm going to go to a different area right now and that's really good because it's going to help the deer populations now or elk populations but you might have a tag where you go 
well, this is a draw tag. There's X amount of tags. Uh, the population was hit, but I've got this tag. What do I do? Should I not hunt it? And the answer is you might actually find a good hunt just by looking for different things, looking in different places and find a little bit, I would say, less competition for the available animals that are there. Now, one of the things that I do do uh, when there's a winter like this is I go through this data and I save what I've when I'm doing all this research, I'm doing this research for this year, yes, but I'm primarily doing this research to give myself notes for futures to come. So the areas that had bad fawn crops, bad survival rates, I'm going to look at that and go, okay, what's going to happen? Not necessarily right now because there's there's going to be deer in that like healthy phase that survive. They move on. They're they're going to have an addition of food and water and good habitat for a few years to come, hopefully, uh, so long as it doesn't drop right into a drought or do the same thing year after year. But, you know, there's the potential that there's still animals there. When I looked at back at that example that I used in the story, we see that the year of the bad winter, there was still quite a few big deer killed. The next few years, there's still, and it slowly started to taper off till it got to that age of, missing age class and then for a couple years lagging it was just slow build slow build slow build and then started to jump back up as we had some more of those big populations so the thing that i'm doing is i'm making a lot of notes and i'm saying like okay i might even put a reminder in my phone for five six years from now and say hey this area that you used to apply for or you know think about it had a harsh winter 90% 90% mortality in, in deer fawns this particular year, keep an eye out, right? Because these are some of the areas that I go, okay, you forget about this stuff five years from now. And one of the things that I started doing is paying attention to this and really thinking about, you know, how those harsh winters affect things in the future. Now, there's a couple things that I do think about as well when it comes to winters and uh potentially that season when I'm looking at a particular area. So I might pull out my go hunt maps and I've decided like, Hey, this particular unit got hit, but a lot of the deer migrated out that area got hit, but not as bad. What's the area they're going back to look like areas that have a uh, potential for better feed. So areas that they're going back to with high moisture that maybe was a burn, a fresh burn in recent years. I go, that's an area that's really going to benefit from this added water, especially if it's elk. It's going to grow better grass. They're going to have better feed. And this might boost the antler size by 10 plus inches. So your average bull might be a 320. Now he's a 330 and those higher end bulls might just boost a few inches. This happened to me on the biggest bull I killed. It was a good water year. The end, there was a fresh burn. An elk that years prior was probably a 360 boosted up to a 390 because he just had everything he needed. It was the perfect storm. And by mixing those things together, now we've got a really good area out of what maybe almost at the onset looked like it would have been really bad. And so by finding the places that match those things where you go – Okay, the I can see the water. I can see that you know, there's still animals here. They didn't. They all didn't die off. It's gonna have. It's got better potential for better feed because of certain factors, or maybe just the units just designed for that. Hey, there's a lot of south facing slopes here that normally dry off. The there's a lot of maybe it's a more arid area, and now it's gonna benefit from that added grass, that added moisture. These are the areas that I'm gonna focus on personally. And then I'm going to try to find those little sleeper spots where I go, it didn't get hit as bad as this part or this part. There's, that was one of the reasons that I did a lot of driving this year. I said, it's a bad winter. I need to know what I'm going to do. I was, went to an area that I would have liked to hunt and go, man, that place got hit real hard. But when I look at the snow map, it said that the whole thing got hit real hard and there was two mountain ranges in there that looked like snow didn't even touch them. So I go, ooh, I just found a little honey hole. And you can find those things. You go, well, how do I find that if I didn't drive around or didn't, you know, I mean, that's just the advantage of putting in that extra time. But you can, there's a couple other things you could do. You could, you could probably look at, you know, past 
past satellite imagery. You can look at, I mean, sometimes that lines up, sometimes it doesn't. So it's not that accurate, but sometimes it is. Other things you can do is just start pulling up individual weather stations, mountain ranges, and start really diving into all the little data and go, mm, I found an anomaly here. I found something that just, why does this not add up? Why did this area not get hit as hard as everything else? And what happens is, Sometimes you find that and you go, okay, the area that got hit hard, a lot of those animals could have migrated to this area. We don't know though. They might not have known that that particular spot didn't have the same snowfall. But hey, this area, the resident deer and elk that are here are probably still going to be here. Maybe I'm going to get less hunting pressure and fewer applications. So I'm still going to apply for this. I know where to go. And I think that I'm still going to have a good hunt. I really think that some incredible animals are going to be taken this season. I think that they're going to come from areas that traditionally needed that water. And I think that there's going to be some quote unquote sleeper spots within areas that look like they got hit pretty hard. And the guys that pay a lot of attention to the details, pay a lot of attention to the data and really plan out their hunt and go, look, Hey, I got X amount of time and dollars to invest into this. I'm going to change my application strategy. I'm going to change the places I'm looking at. I'm going to really focus on, the data here and then I'm going to make my plan are going to come out on top and it's going to be as the weatherman predicts a very successful season for some well I hope you guys really enjoyed that you know I think this year's a really good year to to step back and just do a little extra research one of the tools that I think is extremely valuable for a lot of this research and the reason that I partner with them go hunt insider has so much of this information built into it so it's got a lot of outside of just the application stuff. When we talk about applications and researching units, you go, well, how do I know if it's a migration area? How do I know if animals migrate in and out? How do I know all of these things if I'm not familiar with the area? The research sections on all the areas definitely help with that. And then also as an insider member, you get access to the Explorer maps or you could just get the Explorer maps. Uh, and those maps have a lot of features that are very specific to scouting and hunting. This is for Western big game hunters. That's what they're designed for. That's what their bread and butter is. And so when I do a lot of this research, I can just do 99% of the research that I'm going to do inside this program because I can, I can do that. I can learn about the area, which I think is super valuable. And then I can also jump over to the maps and say, okay, here's a, an area where I go, what was the average snow level? What's like, I'll put in an elevation. I'll do the elevation highlight and I'll say, okay, this entire unit is over 7,000 feet. It got higher than average snowfall. And it sounds like there's resident deer that live here. They're gone, right? Like they just didn't survive. So I can match all those things up within the app and really start to hone in on places to go. I can also do that once I've drawn a tag and really, you know, dive into that extra layer of research and e-scouting and say, okay, where are those places in this unit that maybe the deer and elk moved to? And if I get in there and there's still snowfall, like I can really have this mapped out and planned out and really thought out before the season and take advantage of some of the benefits that might actually come from additional water, especially in a lot of places that are traditionally more arid so i can look at their information and say hey this place is particularly arid and now it just got a lot of water i think that's going to be a benefit as always you guys if you use code live wild you you'll actually get if you sign up for the insider you get 50 dollars in the go hunt store so we just give you 50 dollars to buy in gear and then you'll also get for the explorer maps 20 dollars back for explorer maps in gear and you can always at any time whether you remember or not use code live wild in the go hunt gear shop for 10 percent off gear so stuff that might not traditionally go on sale you can get a little bit of a discount we do that for the listeners i think that that's something cool that they did that was something that i wanted asked from them and they were willing to do it so just as a benefit to everybody that listens and then as a reminder too we've got outdoor class you can use code live wild on that you'll get 20 percent off you know whatever try to save money when you can where you can cost of everything's going up but there's some really good tools in there that i think especially there's a new e-scouting program in there that i think you'll really like and some of the stuff that we've been talking about they dive deep into e-scouting and this might be something that you want to look at so you can only get so much information from podcasts without seeing it and that's the thing that i really like about outdoor classes 
the classes that all the instructors put together, we put a lot of time into it. I mean, I've got another one coming out here pretty soon about archery mule deer hunting. And it's like essentially a month's worth of work compiling data and, and getting video and all, and all this stuff just to make it very in-depth where you can see the stuff that I'm talking about in a different way. And you know, the, the graphics and everything are, are really cool. And I think it really illustrates some of the points really well. So just something to think about as we just start in this planning phase and going into the hunting season, I think these are things that are going to benefit you. And that's why I talk about them. And that's why I've partnered with these companies. So I thank those companies a lot for jumping on with this podcast, but also for you know, being willing to give you guys something back as well. And I just giving something back. Thank you, everybody that listens to this podcast. I really do appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's, the support's been awesome and it just keeps me going. I, I'm really glad to be able to bring this podcast to you. And I know a lot of you find it valuable. Thank you guys so much for those of you that subscribe. If you don't subscribe, it helps us out. Just click the subscribe button wherever you listen to your podcast and feel free to give us a rating. If you can rate it, drop a comment. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about uh, some of the stuff that we've got coming up, I think we've got some pretty good topics to hit. But if there's some things that you guys want to hear, as always, just reach out to me via social media. Generally, message me at Instagram. I love to hear the things that you guys want to learn about. Every once in a while, I'll get an email and be like, okay, I've got enough of these. That's the topic. And sometimes I get one. It's like, that's a very unique idea and just make a podcast on it. And that's a lot of fun for me. So Hey, I might be talking to one person, but I know that one person is really excited about this particular episode. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, until next week, I'm going to say, let the summer come. <laughs> I'm sick of winter. <laughs> Catch you guys later. Hey, if you guys really enjoy these videos that I'm putting out, make sure to subscribe to my channel. It really helps me out a lot. Also, feel free to drop a comment or like the video. I really appreciate it.